Welcome to the Troy University Big Read uh, Roundtable Discussions. I'm uh, Dr. Richard Scott Noakes. I'm an Associate uh, Professor of Medieval Literature here at Troy University. And uh, today we're going to be discussing censorship and access uh, in the era of digital media. And we're, of course, going to be using uh, Fahrenheit 451, uh, our uh, reading initiative uh, book uh, this year, as our starting point. And today I'm joined by uh, three wonderful guests. Uh, Dr. Uh, Victoria Willis is a research analyst at Georgia State University. She writes about the intersections of rhetoric, literary theory, and popular culture, and she's the co-editor of Geek Rock, an exploration of music and subculture, available on Amazon.com. Uh, uh, Dr. Brett Woods is an ethnomediologist, and he currently serves as an assistant professor of ethnomusicology at the School of Music here at Troy University. He's also a filmmaker and the director of 2012 award-winning uh, documentary film Human Scab. Uh, and um, we're also joined by uh, Michael McNamara. He is a systems architect at Witan Publishing, uh, a, an e-publisher, and he has adapted many medieval uh, and modern print works into ebook formats, and he's currently editing a book on medieval literature uh, by 18th century antiquary Elizabeth Elstow. So let's uh, start off today by talking a little bit about Fahrenheit 451. We'll use that as our starting point. Um, now, in uh, the end of Fahrenheit 451, Guy Montag, uh, who's the main character, he becomes a fugitive. And while he's on the run, he meets a, a group of, of people who have memorized books in order to pass them along. And the leader of this group, uh, he tells Montag, we're book burners too, we read the books, sorry, we read the books and burnt them, afraid they'd be found. Um, in essence, they have to move books from the print uh, uh, medium into the oral medium. So how has our understanding of the idea of what is a book uh, or what is an album changed as we've moved into the electronic uh, media? Uh, Brett, would you like to? Um, well, when I think about, um, when I think about moving from the book itself into memorizing that book. I really think a lot about uh, orality and literacy in general, and just how orality, there's a sort of conversant element to speaking. Sort of like what we're doing now, um, we're able to talk. Um, uh, and, and so in that dialogue, what I say, um, you can sort of see how someone is taking what you say. and. Uh, but the book doesn't have that quality to it. There's a certain text and a, an authority that is sort of assumed with um, that text. Um, and so when we move into the, the electronic medium, I don't think that necessarily that authority has gone away. It's just that the accessibility to that text now uh, goes from whatever you're able to print or whatever you're able to scribe into, you know, it, it's a virtual world essentially where you have access to I mean, it, it's essentially zeros and ones, right? So, I mean, I think it changes the game a little bit in the way that we think about, um, you know, the, a power or authority that, that that word or the literacy itself has. And so we're thinking about the character Montag and um, just sort of his encounter with th these people, um, you, you know, I, I'm wondering if there if there's a way that we can sort of toss this idea around the table with regard to orality and literacy. When he encounters these people, um, the, what is happening to the authority of the book itself? Um, when these people are memorizing the book, are they creating a new sense of authority um, or a new sort of conversant way in which that te te text exists in a, in a new context? And how is, how is that affecting the world that Montag lives in? Well, I know, Michael, the, uh, one of the things that the project you're working on now is essentially it starts off as uh, manuscript-based medieval mm. works. And then in the 18th century, this antiquarian scholar, Elizabeth Elstob, turned it into print. And now you're taking this 18th century print text and turning it into a kind of electronic uh, 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 e-book. Um, how have you sort of had, to, I mean, how do you deal with the question of how do you present this e-book and what authority does it have if it's not... Uh, if it's not in print or even in manuscript anymore. Well, you know, the original, the original version of what we're actually taking it from, turning it into ebook form, is still there. You know, and whatever authority that had is not going to go away. You know, like as as we were talking here, the the people that Montag had met there at the end that had burned the books and then memorized them. I I didn't like that so much. I wish they hadn't burned the <laughs> books. It's 
you know, as a, as a you know, computer-like person, uh, the idea of getting rid of your backup is never a good idea. <laughs> to me, I, I didn't like that. I mean, keep them, bury them, put them in a canister, and you know, throw them into the sea, but don't burn them. You know, mm -hmm. and, uh, because you know, whatever authority people may have, you need to keep with that. You know, I mean, we're, we're creating an ebook version of Elstab, but we're still gonna. There's nothing that's gonna happen to the original. It's still there. Whatever it has is just kind of, you know, it's gonna remain with it. If that artifact but, disappears, does it keep its authority? Then? That's that's for the reader to decide. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's what's so fascinating too. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, maybe in a way it kind of does because we seem <clears throat> to keep trying to recreate that artifact. Like we keep taking blogs mm -hmm. and then turning them into books. Like the only thing I can think of off the top of my head is hyperbole and a half because it's on my to read list. But I mean that's a blog. You can just go read the whole blog. Yeah, you don't have yeah. to buy it in book mm -hmm. form. But we seem to want it in book form and to pay for it that way. This free thing. Which is kind of interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe it's just I always maybe somebody doesn't have a computer. How True. else are they going to read it? That, that's the well, that's the way I have to look at it. But I, but I also think that there's still a fetishization of this sense, and and I think you said it too, the original, mm -hmm. the sense that there was a specific source, and that source for us in books becomes a text. Um, but you know, did did we have that sense of original uh, authority in a text before? there was literacy in the way that you know, it's mass produced on, on, a, on a grand mechanical scale. When, when words or stories themselves were more conversant, um, was there this fetishization of the original and, and that authority that the original uh, had? I mean, and that extends not just to books, but to many, many different things. The, the original artwork, the original album uh, of the Beatles. You know, th there's a certain sense of originality and I feel like we've inherited that definition in a certain way uh, that has to do with this transition between orality and literacy um, and it has to do with the, uh, the authority that that carries with it that the, the text carries with it the picture in my mind is um, you know it's thinking in medieval history mm -hmm. you know when communities gathered around in a church no one was literate except for the clergy and the clergy had the authority to tell people out of this text what the you know sort of the order of things were to essentialize a little bit um, and I'm wondering if that authority really plays a role in the way we think about the, the permanence or the mutability of text. I think, too, it's interesting that the very word authority has in its root the idea of the author, right? That the, that the author mm -hmm. is where the, the authority, in a sense, is, and yet we have so many texts. I mean, in Fahrenheit 451, we have, we have the author, uh, but often we don't know who the author is, mm -hmm. which actually, I think, gets at this uh, another question. So then, is there any book uh, that you would argue really should only be read in paper form or any album that you would say this really should only be heard on vinyl or or in some other uh or a track uh <laughs> this one um i i have a kindle i love my kindle like i love to buy things for my kindle i love having like a thousand thousand books that i could just have at any possible moment like e but I have not purchased Fahrenheit 451 for Kindle. Now other books that I have in like paper format, I've gone so I can just have it with me wherever I wanna go. Um, but I feel that Ray Bradbury would be very sad. So I keep this in my, my paper form. Cause I mean, with everything with the parlors and screens, I feel that reading it on a screen is kind of, kind of wrong. Maybe not wrong to me, but it, and author intentionality, you know, is murky, but that's, I want to give Ray Bradbury his paper you book. Don't, you don't have to tell him, though. If you, if you download it, <laughs> we're not going to tell him. So, right. It'll be our secret. Right. Is there any, well, I mean, you work in music. So is there anything that, that you think, I'm not going to listen to this online. I, I have to listen to it in, in a particular medium? Really, no. I mean, I, I think that it, it just really depends on the situation. Uh, yeah, there is a certain aesthetic quality to listening to, uh, I don't know, Cabaret Voltaire on vinyl, you know, because when it was when it first was released you know it was released on the medium of the LP so part of the transient noise that's in actually playing back on a record it's going to be evident in uh, playing it back on the vinyl so perhaps if you're feeling that that is part of the experience that you want to have then then sure um, but you know and, and also in in the audio medium it, there are a lot of questions with regard to how 
uh, something is recorded. We, we go to great lengths when we're audio engineering to try to remove a lot of noise. And, and we do this in other mediums too, like in photography, we try to remove noise and we try to, you know, like all the lighting here is, is in an effort to make sure that there isn't uh, a, a clouded picture. But I mean, in all the decisions that we're making, I think that that's just a way for us to present the media. And so the substance behind all of that technology, I suppose, is really what's at question from my perspective. And so beyond the, the specific experience, I would say probably not. But it comes to the specific experience then. Yeah, I mean, but you can foster that experience. And if you want to do so, I mean, well, I'm thinking if you're historically recreating a, a medieval, um, mm. uh, let's say, a liturgical drama that Hildegard of Bingen wrote or something like that, well, we don't know recordings of that. We have absolutely no idea how that might have sounded, but we can sort of piece it together. But in so doing, the valence of our own understanding of how the technology should affect that recording inevitably plays a role. But then maybe, you know, 150 years from now, that will change a little bit. Um, you know, so, and then there'll be two different versions of that particular recording, and who's to say which one is better or worse? Mm -hmm. It just sort of depends. Michael, did you? Pop-up books? <laughs> Until we get, you know, 3D holographic displays, a pop-up book is just never going to be the same as it is, you know, if you're, if you're actually holding. But I, I have to say, I disagree that Ray Bradbury wouldn't like his book in ebook form. I think he'd love it. Really? You know, because it would be a way to make it permanent. You know, there's no way you can burn all the copies of an ebook because once you've created it and put it out there, you know, it quickly starts disseminating everywhere. And there's no way to get rid of it, every, every, everything, you know, mm -hmm. everybody will have their own private copy of it, and the book can never really truly be burned. Kind of like memorizing it. Exactly, kind of mm -hmm. like memorizing you know, although, although in the book, you know, the, you know, they made a point in the book that there was always just one person that memorized the one thing. You know, imagine if, like, they had a thousand people memorizing the same thing. That, that's, that's kind of what an e-book is like. So, so I, 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 I think you wouldn't have a problem with it, but, uh, yeah. Um, in, in a lot of ways, New, new technologies have, have, in some ways, in obvious ways that people talk about all the time, they've really increased access. And in some ways, it made censorship um, more difficult or, or uh, uh, at least more problematic. Um, in the days of my wasted youth, I, I, went, uh, I lived in the former Soviet Union. And I remember I went to the school, and they had a fax machine. And uh, they were considered extremely Western for having a fax machine at the school. And uh, the fax machine was often credited as being one as being the, the technological development that essentially took down the Soviet Union because it became impossible to control information when someone could fairly anonymously mm -hmm. uh, send something out all over the place. And so what used to be kind of uh, Sami's dot where copying things would be s spread around. Um, and now fax machine, um, I think we still have a fax machine in our department, but I can't remember the last time I've used it. Uh, you know. All those have changed also. How, what ways that we might not think of have new technologies sort of made access easier and made censorship more difficult? Oh, no, you pretty much said it there. I mean, it's just different versions of the, the fax machine analogy. I mean, the way of, you know, when you hear about, you know, uh, oppressive governments in the world, the main thing they're doing to try to clamp down their people is preventing access to the Internet, either cutting it off entirely or restricting the amount of sites that people can go to severely. Because it is, like you said with the fact, it's a dangerous thing mm -hmm. for controlling information because unless you cut it off at the source of the internet, there's no way, uh, there's no way that you're going to be able to control what people are ultimately saying. Because mm -hmm. everyone can get on the internet, web browser, and see whatever they want to. But now the flip side of that then is it becomes possible to monitor uh, down to the level of how long is someone looking at a page. You oh, can not true. only monitor yeah. what people are reading, but you can know exactly uh, uh, how long they're on a page and... What uh, words they linger over or stuff right. like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Very so much you know so. if they've searched something. So, um, And there's this sort of famous case uh, a, a few years ago when Amazon sort of silently, there was a copyright dispute and Amazon silently deleted some copies of 1984 from people's Kindles and, hmm. and refunded their money. Um, and that didn't receive a lot of good press for them, uh, but it was possible mm -hmm. that, like, that just Sadly suddenly, enough, yeah. suddenly the book disappeared, and probably it happened to thousands of people mm -hmm. who didn't even notice because well, they'd already read. Well, that, that's why I've never liked the idea of a Wi-Fi enabled Kindle mm -hmm. or or Nook. I like the idea of the device being itself and you know being able to contain two thousand books, but I don't like the idea of it also having a wireless connection. You know, I, I mean, I own one, and I made sure. Uh, 
I'm pretty sure it was way back. I might have got a, a, a non-Wi-Fi model, but mm -hmm. there were Sony readers you could get like that, but uh, later ones did have Wi-Fi, of course. Just, yeah. So the same stream that gives ac provides access mm -hmm. one way provides access the other way, provides the opportunity for to, to censor or monitor your, your use, is that right? Yeah, if, if you don't have security. I mean, a lot of the internet is based around security, too. Security, mm -hmm. encryption, you know, the idea of, uh, if you've ever gone to a website and it says HTTPS, you know, that, that whole thing was all about preventing someone from watching what you were doing. You mm -hmm. go to a website that was enabled with HTTPS, you know, the government, a third party, couldn't look at what you were doing. They couldn't mm -hmm. see what you were doing, how long you were lingering on a thing. And, you know, that, that was one of the biggest uh, things that was revealed with the recent, uh, what was it, the NSA encryption program, was that they had kind of cracked those keys. They had broke the trust that you had with these websites that nobody was going to be watching. And that was, that was one of the worst things that happened out of that. Yeah. Is there, um, how does censorship look different than in this? Well, some of the access, too, is limited anyway, right? Because you have to pay to access certain certain things, like certain like databases or journal articles or or even music. I mean, Spotify, you can, you know, if you're at your computer, it's free. But if you're on a device, you have to pay a monthly subscription in order to, to have that. So, I mean, it's, I guess it's a limited open access, limited access. Well, and we also have this different model where in the past, if you purchased a book, you permanently had that book. And, you know, you had the physical object. If you lost the physical object, you lost the book. But, you know, uh, but today, if you're, if you have, if it's a subscription service, you lose your subscription, you lose access to everything on that service, whether you read it or not. Right? So. And with some books, too, if you, you have a paper edition, Amazon will let you buy the e-edition at a that. discounted yeah. price. Yeah. But it's only for certain books, too, which really highlights, like, everything and all the contra like contractual obligations that go mm -hmm. into access mm -hmm. as well, like the mm -hmm. Amazon versus the Hackett group. Yes, right. Um, did you, so what are some ways then, I mean, what does all this mean then in terms of, for music, for example, what does that mm -hmm. mean where people can, what does it mean to own something in this context at all? Right, well, that's my question. Um, I think that, Back in the 1999-2000 era, um, when Napster was taken to court and um, subsequent decisions made by Apple iTunes and so forth really transitioned people who were interacting with media from being owners to users. Um, and I think that some of this has implications for what you were talking about. Um, with regard to w when something is put out on the internet, there are just digital copies. I mean, copies upon copies upon copies. Um, so, like, is, it, is there really an original anymore? Or, you know, is there an original idea? Uh, you know, these are all just sort of these weird existential questions that float around, you know. Yeah. And there are questions, unfortunately, that the Supreme Court and, and a lot of uh, law lawmakers in our world uh, they don't understand how to address. They have to come up with very weird, antiquated analogies um, for, for how to deal with this stuff. Um, but with regard to music, I mean, I don't know if I could speak to, you know, the, the sort of the generality of the question, but I do ask that, that very thing. What, what does it mean to own something? I mean, you had just said that you lose your, your access, you lose the sort of subscription, you lose access to all of the materials in that subscription. But that's the thing is that you had access to that stuff before. So I don't, I don't know if people nowadays tend to find themselves thinking that they own something. Um, but then that, asks, that begs a larger question as to if, you don't, if you're not an owner and you're just a user, then where, is, where does the authority lie? And perhaps that's what is so challenging in general about something as simple as a fax machine in the Soviet Union, is that if you can share an idea broadly and neutrally enough, mm -hmm. um, you know, then an example that I, I sometimes use with regard to music is if I were to bring a, a boombox in here and play an album for everybody, uh, we all will get a chance to hear what's going on and, and, and talk about it. But if I were to upload that MP3 or whatever file format you prefer uh, to the web and I were to share that with a bunch of people in kind of the same way, now there's a digital copy of that in a way that I think that we're still sort of attached to the sense of ownership. 
Um, but it really, I mean, people I, I don't think are collecting vast quantities of digital information, mm -hmm. thinking that they're sitting on a treasure trove of wonders. You know, in the way that you would if you collected first edition books or um, first edition albums or something to that effect. So. What, what is ownership really? Uh, how do we use that term anymore? I guess it, the sort of old model was that the, the artist owned a right to the material and the object itself, whether it was a, a record pressing or a, a, or, a, a, or, or, or a codex or whatever, that was owned by the user. But now the, u the user has, it's a right, the user yeah. owns a right. The author owns, owns a right. The the distributor has a right, and so everyone. It's now ownership is about competing rights, and there's very often not the physical object anymore. Right, and, and I think that shift in terminology changes the way that uh, people who need to hold on to that authority or that control or the financial gain for these particular items, whether they're digital, print, or otherwise. I mean that that's where we have begun to develop this. Uh, language of piracy and sort of the, the culture mm -hmm. of piracy and what it means to be a pirate and right. that sort of stuff. And even sort of in a more kind of um, uh, nuanced uh, question than even that is, uh, you know, how much of the access you have, and I think this brings up a, an issue that has been in the news a lot lately, which is the issue of net neutrality and the impact that could have on all this. Uh, Michael is our technical expert. You want to explain to everyone what I will, net neutrality is? I will try is. to do the impossible and explain net neutrality in 30 <laughs> seconds. Sure. Uh, net neutrality is the belief that all data uh, transmitted on the internet should be treated equally at, you know, I guess maybe at the bit level, you know, zeros and ones, that your zeros and ones will not be stopped because someone else's zeros and ones are treated better than yours, you know, treated it. Either they pay for it or just someone makes a decision that they'll be treated better. And that's pretty much it. Actually, that's pretty good. Thank you. Yeah, that was, that yeah. was awesome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there go, right? so, so, yeah. so the idea is that, um, so the idea is is that if you don't have net neutrality, mm -hmm. then um, it isn't that you someone a user might not have access mm -hmm. necessarily to a site, although you, you that could, could theoretically you could like do that. that. Yeah. But even the access to that site would be so slow that it would make it a kind of practical barrier yeah. to usage, yeah. or or at least enough to 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 dissuade them maybe from reading it. Right. Or, or downloading it or Do you, whatever. I mean, are there ways in which you see this as being a problem that will have sort of broader reaching implications than just sort of what what the, the technical world uh, cares about? It kind of takes me back to, I guess, the idea of ownership because all of that becomes much more like murky and problematic. Like if you, you know, write a book or you make an album and you want to put it out there and you're being, you know, I guess, thwarted because you can't pay all this money to get lots of promotion or to get like the highest hit like that's a big problem and just even being seen and kind of perpetuates the like well you know we'll make you visible and you should be grateful ha 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 sort of thing but also I mean the idea of something like not having ownership like who do you pay like you're paying services but how much do the the writers and the artists and the painters like really see from any of that too like mm -hmm. so you don't have any money to promote yourself for more money that you're not going to get it creates this like really problematic cycle yeah and i think too it creates the question of maybe i now i have the right to access this streaming music or this book or this audio book or this film or whatever I have the, have the right to access that um, legally I have the right to access it but the access to that is so restricted they don't have practical aspect yeah. to it, a, a, access and to that, it. that's actually happened and, recently yeah, yeah and so do I now own it uh, you know mm -hmm. the, now the question becomes can you even own something that you in a practical sense can't access you know does that right mean anything at that point Right, that's a good question. I mean, but I mean, maybe then we have to try to find a colloquial way that we use own, you know, <laughs> or if that even matters anymore. Um, it, it, it reminds me a little bit too of the, the, another major sort of definition that we've inherited that has to do with um, expertise or, um, you know, what is an expert anymore, really? And why? I mean, why would, why would that authority need to exist? I think web developers have, introduce a really interesting model. And that is that coming out with a product, and this is just sort of a part of things that people who develop uh, programs, plugins, you know, content management systems, you name it, 
uh, they developed the model of this is my product, this is my idea. You can download a digital copy of it, and you know, how about you donate a little bit of money, buy me a coffee, or something like that. There's there's a more conversant uh, sort of dialogue-like flow to that, as opposed to this is how much this costs, and if you don't pay this, then you're going to be chased down, and you know we're gonna you know hunt you down, and you're you're a pirate. You know, like, mm -hmm. do, do you have what advice? Just to sort of draw things uh, to a close here, what advice do you have for authors and artists and musicians about access to their work in uh, digital and electronic media? Oh, gosh. Um, well, I think that if you want, I mean, if you're writing or you're producing music or something to that effect, um, and it's something that is coming from here, it's, it's, it's an articulation of your creativity that is going to be shared in the social space then that truly should be shared. And that um, it should be done so without the sort of vestiges of this sense of ownership. Um, it, it should be done so in, in a spirit of sharing. Because ultimately, I mean, that's, that's how people are going to really get uh, a sense that this is something that I want to pay attention to. Um, so make it available. Uh, and if you can make it available digitally, great. Uh, I think digital is a great direction to go for music, for, for literature, for art, but it doesn't have to just be that. Anything that brings a group of people together where they can converse, they can ask questions, they can share ideas, and, and create a shared space of understanding um, socially, I think is, is good. And, and I want to be able to contribute to that financially. So mm -hmm. uh, that, my advice would be if you want to share, like, if you want to be able to be a part of that space, share, yeah, I suppose. No, it, I kind of agree. Kind of, I was kind of going to say something similar to that. And you know, when my company we're trying to sell an ebook, when we're trying to make it available, we have to be very careful. And it ties back into what you said about ownership. Not giving one distribution channel like Amazon or Barnes and Noble exclusive rights to distribute our product, because you know, every step of the way, Amazon is trying to get me to restrict my books only to Amazon. They're trying to give me special deals. They're trying to give me a greater cut of royalties, things like that. Mm. And I have to make sure to resist that every single time because then I'm, I'm restricting how many people can buy my book. If I only sell it on Amazon, people have, may have a Barnes & Noble Nook reader. They can't, they can't download it anymore. And you just have to make sure to not get caught up in those, those things because when you do that, you're essentially giving Amazon ownership of your book because only they can, they can distribute it to people at that point. It's almost mm -hmm. like they have ownership of it. Yeah. So just whenever you're trying to sell a book or make a book and, and say you want to distribute it digitally, make sure to, I don't want to say spread it as thin as possible, but definitely throw it out there at as many different places as possible. And I think also, I, I know that your uh, Witan Publishing also one of the reasons that it supports Nook is because they have an they use open source. They, they did use a more right. open source of, of format than Amazon did there. Yeah. Would you like the last word on this? Um, grassroots efforts are good too, like mm -hmm. format making a new model, things like Kickstarter and Indiegogo. So don't forget those either if you're trying to write something or create something and put it out there. Those are also really good resources. Okay, great. All right. Well, uh, that's about all the time we have for today. I want to thank, uh, thank you all for uh, uh, joining us, and we will be here again, uh, perhaps another group, I think, for another uh, round uh, with Detroit University uh, Big Read Roundtables. Thank you very much. <laughs>